So welcome. Um, I haven't done this in uh, about 10 years, so this is my first lecture um, after, uh, after this time. And uh, a little bit of feedback, OK. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, what it's like um, to be a CTO in a startup company um, and um, where do we make mistakes and how to try to fix them. So first, who am I? My name is Sur Trebets and I'm the CTO of SmartPA.do. Um, you can follow me on different uh, networks. Um, and um, our company is, uh, our main product is Datafy uh, IT, which is a search engine for business contacts. Um, we also do um, data enrichment and um, data cleanup for um, specific, um, or for um, custom uh, customers. And um, we help, um, we help companies uh, improve their sales um, process and um, get them more money in the end. Um, but I'm here today to talk about my job and not about the company. So what is a CTO and what's his job? Huh, okay. So this is what Wikipedia tells us. It sounds important. It sounds glamorous, but reality is quite different. Um, chances are that you will work in a small company, uh, in a small startup, where CTO is actually just one of the developers. It's usually the one who pulled the short stick when you were choosing one. It's the one who worries about everything. It's the one who reads everything about everything. The one who must learn a few soft skills, not just uh, technical stuff, um, and the one who drinks the most beer. Why? We'll see uh, a little bit later. So reasons why you don't want to be a CTO. No sleep. Seriously, my sleep has been severely, severely impacted in the last three years since I've uh, took this position. And uh, this is because you get to be the go-to guy for everything. Something is broken, website doesn't work, my email doesn't work, server crashed, we're out of beer, <laughs> too much stuff. So this is what you have to solve at three in the morning, at any given time. So what can you do to help yourself sleep better? Well, there are a few things. First thing, this is a little technical, but uh, monitoring and alerting. This is something uh, which is crucial for uh, CTO's peace of mind. Uh, without it, you, I would be always uh, checking uh, services, if they work, if they don't work. I would be always in panic mode and expecting something terrible to happen. I still do, but I somehow rely on other things to let me know when things are getting, uh, going wrong. Um, well, now, now we're, we're uh, near everything, but I still try to document as much as uh, possible uh, from system architecture to disaster recovery procedures. This gives me another level of assurance that someone will be able to, do some, to fix something when I'm not around or uh, I'm not available to, um, to jump in and fix it. Uh, and things will go wrong all the time. So uh, one of the things that you can also do is um, establish an on-duty, off-duty rotation within your team. <clears throat> within your team. While we are a small team at the moment, uh, we have three, um, three developers, and they're all uh, in the 
in, in this room, so you can talk to them afterwards if you don't believe me. Uh, but um, this offers an opportunity to relax uh, at least two days uh, in a row and uh, not jump onto every issue that comes up. Um, the last thing um, is to try and design um, a self-healing system. Um, this is most importantly in a dist highly distributed system uh, with a lot of moving parts, something will go wrong somewhere, and at any given moment, you have to be able to rely on, um, on some automation that if something breaks, it will try to uh, mitigate it, and you won't believe how much sleep I was able to get back by just um, enabling a system to self-restart when it crashes. Um, this is uh, something um, very important in our, um, in our, in our system. Um, next thing is customers. Everybody loves customers, right? But they can be pain in the butt. Uh, they always want some, that one feature that you haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, they always find an edge case that you, could ne you thought never happened and your tests don't cover. Um, or they use Internet Explorer. <laughs> Behind the firewall, through a proxy, over ISDN from China. <laughs> but in the end, you need customers and you want them because early adopters will find bugs and pay you for the privilege and who else will pay you for debugging your code. Uh, so you should get as many as possible. Um, your job as a company is always to solve other people's problems. So um, solve their problems, not yours. If, you, if your product can solve your problems too, that's the best way to go. But in the end, customers m must get value and they must be happy. Have a way to talk to them. In-app chat proves to be the most rewarding way to uh, get feedback uh, and to help customers when they need it. Uh, when they're confused, when they um, need to, uh, to talk to somebody and they, not get, they do not get frustrated when something breaks. And when something breaks, you should let them know. Uh, there is a, a simple notification in our app that tells them that we're um, making improvements to it and after we established that uh, there were no complaints at all when something didn't go as they wanted. Um, so that gives you a much more satisfied customer and uh, turns a potentially grumpy user into a returning customer. Something you have to do um, to keep your team happy or to help your customer um, when something goes wrong is have a way to dig into your system and figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. Um, error reporting uh, uh, is something that's crucial and usually you will get a report before the customer even, even um, knows something went wrong. And when they ask you what's wrong, you can already tell them, yeah, we fixed it. So use Sentry for uh, such things. There are other systems, but um, this is something I recommend. Another way, another thing uh, which is very valuable is a, uh, a way to be able to search through uh, your system's logs. Um, this is, uh, we, we use Logstash and uh, Elk uh, stack to, to do this. Um, and it's been invaluable in many times. Um, we are currently generating around 30 gigabytes of logs every day. Um, so you can imagine uh, browsing 
or uh, digging through that by hand using, um, using command line tools would be uh, a pain in the ass. Um, I mentioned before, monitoring, we're using New Relic at the moment. Um, this is something that you really need to um, have as, a, as the owner of the system, as the owner of the technical stack to give you feedback what's going on um, on the hardware level. Well, not only my responsibility, code is usually what we work on every day. And after a while of writing code and putting it into production, you find out that legacy code sucks. Um, but it, it's inevitable and the bigger your system gets, the larger the amount of code you have in production that is just there to fail. So you should try and mitigate that and make yourself um, a little more confident about, uh, about your code. So um, give your team ownership of the code. Nobody wants to be responsible for the code somebody else wrote. And uh, it becomes a matter of pride to have your own code work flawlessly uh, and not break. So by giving your team the ownership of the code, you make, your co uh, you make the code better. Um, writing tests is one of the ways a team member can signal other team members, members that um, I've thought about this um, there, and here are the tests to prove it. Um, but turns out that writing tests and actually running tests should not be taken for granted. Uh, so having a way to have the test run automatically and uh, not really think about that um, can give you another way of peace of mind um, in your system, another level of confidence. And while computers are good at running code, they can't really understand it, unfortunately. And reviewing each other's code is the single greatest contribution um, to a working system. So read others' code. Um, we, have a, we have a silent um, understanding that if you write it, you support it. This is usually um, not so, um, not possible to have in the long run because your, your teammates leave and then somebody else inherits their code. But while you have your teammates there, um, if somebody writes a piece of code and they take ownership of it, uh, they should support it. Developers, there's never enough of them, <laughs> or us. Um, but ha being a, a team lead in a small group um, gives you an opportunity to, to boost the productivity into a new level. And um, you should, as a, uh, as, a, as a technical lead and as an organization lead, um, try to give them anything and everything possible to make their job easier. Um, I found that organizing the development process, organizing the, um, the communication, organizing formalizing in some, some ways um, the processes that are needed to come from a, an idea to a piece of code that actually runs in the production um, gives you a very, um, very big boost in, conf in confidence and very large boost in productivity. So um, organize your people, use tracking, use um, use communication tools, use um, source control that enables you to talk to one another. Uh, give your team the, res the responsibility uh, in your system. Uh, give them a way to deploy with confidence. We give them uh, responsibility with on-call, like I said. Um, and 
let them fail. Because failing is the best way to learn. Um, and without and being the one uh, that's, uh, so, so my job is not to catch every mistake they make. My job is to give them beer when they do. And um, if you think that's something you would want to get, beer when, they f when you fail, you're welcome to join us. Well, if, if everything is difficult and hard um, to, to, to manage, uh, why do I want to do it? Because in spite of everything, or more so because of everything, working on awesome stuff with awesome people makes my job awesome. Thank you. Maybe this is a bit awkward for you to answer, but um, when you say there's never enough developers, is that because they're hard to find or because you don't have the resources to hire them? Yeah, or, so yeah, all of the above. Uh, as a startup, you never have enough resources and uh, being in a startup in Slovenia is twice as hard as every, anywhere else. Uh, so we welcome such things as WebCamp and other conferences to, um, to get in touch with the community and to, to try to inspire people to work on hard problems. And if you work on hard problems with us, um, you get beer. So. <laughs> Um, just to follow up to something you said there, um, you said it's harder in Slovenia to, to hire developers. Um, can you just explain a little bit why, why that? Why, why it is harder? Well, there are a few reasons, but um, one is definitely a, a shallow pool of people. Um, even if there are more and more people getting into um, into coding and developing and so on. Uh, there is still a limited amount uh, of people, which is, does not help the fact that um, we live in a global economy and uh, being a remote developer is easier than ever. So a lot of local people that are good um, are actually freelancing and working for companies abroad where there are more competitive salaries and so on, and uh, as a company in Slovenia, you can't really afford uh, such, uh, such high prices. So uh, we, we, try to, we try to fix that with other, um, other um, incentives and so on, but um, it's getting harder every, every year. So if your company was in the US, how would it be easier than in Slovenia? since you would have to pay those big ranges there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know if I can answer that question because I'm not there. Um, one thing's for sure, uh, fundraising in Slovenia is a, a few orders of magnitude more difficult than in Silicon Valley. And the amount of money um, you can raise is a few orders of magnitude less. Uh, so maybe those two things correlate with the uh, prices of developers. Maybe they don't, but this is what we have.